You know, when I consider the expression, there's no place like home, it gives me a, a warm feeling in my heart because I think about home and I think, well, there's no place that I would rather be. Your home gives us that special feeling that really no other place can give us. For most of us, home is a place of comfort, a place of peace, a place of security. Let's uh, go to Psalm 127 to begin with. The hymn we just sang came from Psalm 127. And in this chapter, Psalm 127, that we'll see that God intended home should be a place where people are secure. But it can only be that way if God is there in the midst of it. So we'll begin in verse 1, Psalm 127, verse 1. It says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. So it doesn't matter how careful you are, how alert you are. You know, if we don't have God there watching over us and, and guiding us, you know, if we're not under God's care, then we have no real security. In verse 2, it goes on and says, It's vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he gives his beloved sleep. So true peace and true comfort in our life can only come from God. You know, his beloved is given sleep, you know, a rest and a break you know, from what's going on outside the home, outside the, the peace and comfort of our, of our home. And so to summarize these two verses is as we yield to God's care, he will direct our course and he will give us a peaceful home. Now this applies in both a physical and a spiritual sense. If we have a physical home, which hopefully is a template for us and how we're trying to make our spiritual home be like. And today, I want us to consider our spiritual home. I want to answer three questions. What is our spiritual home made up of? How do we become part of it? And how should members of this home treat one another? Well, first, I would like to talk a little bit more about our physical home. You know, we're obviously, we're consciously aware of our homes each day. Most of us go home each night after a, a day out and about with work and school and whatever else is going on. Merriam-Webster's online dictionary defines home as, first of all, one's place of residence. You know, but a home, home is really so much more than just four walls and a roof. A house is four walls and a roof. And you, when you walk around in a completely empty house and you hear the echoes you know, when you speak, you, know, you realize that. A home is a place where you feel relaxed, you know, perhaps with your family, a place that's warm and inviting, a place that you look forward to going to. A home should be a place of safety, a place where you can freely grow and develop without fear of being ridiculed or, or put down. A home is some place where you go to stay out of trouble. You know, it's... Uh, Never, you know, very rarely is a good idea. Is it do any? Is it productive to be out and about late at night? Because most of the time, only bad things will happen when you're out and about in the dead of night. So it's it's good to good to be home. Now I realize that you know not all homes are safe. Not all homes are a good environment. But hopefully, we can work to change that. You know, I. Think about the one of the top news stories that we heard this week out in California about those 13 children who were in their home, chained to their beds, parents torturing them, not feeding them, not bathing them, not taking care of them. And, you know, it just breaks my heart, makes me very sad. 
makes me yearn for God's kingdom to come and, and be back soon. And I think about how many more people, how many home, more homes, how many more people are in similar situations that we don't know about. Well, Proverbs chapter 17, Proverbs 17 you know, makes the point that even in an otherwise joyful home, you know, if there is still a bit of strife, a, a bit of contention, then ultimately it, it does undo the good. Proverbs chapter 17 and verse number 1. Proverbs 17 verse 1 says, Better is a dry morsel with quietness than a house full of feasting with strife. You know, it reminds me of a home where you have some good times, maybe you have a lot of good times, but you may also find yourself on edge you know, because there could be strife in the home and you never know when it might turn up next, when it might suddenly manifest itself. And too many people, unfortunately, do experience that in their homes. Your strife hinders you from being able to truly relax in your home. And it's a difficult thing when you have to live with it day after day. You know, in the home, kind of like what we, we just sang about again, you know, God expects the fathers of the home to be the spiritual leaders. You know, let's look at Ephesians chapter 6. You know, the husband, the father, is to make sure that God is front and center in the family. You know, by his actions, by the way he conducts himself, by the things that he does. By teaching his family about what God is and how the law of God is something that should be kept and what the love of God truly is. If we look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 4, it says, And you, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. So it's very important for fathers to be teaching their children. Of course, mothers are not left out of this either. In fact, I would say that most of the time it's the woman who sets the tone in the home. You know, the woman is the one who's oftentimes there the most, the one who is the caretaker, the homemaker, you know, the one who who is around the children and taking care of them more often than when the husband is usually gone at work. You know, we're not going to turn there, but in Proverbs 31 and verse 27, it says that one characteristic of the virtuous wife is that she watches over the ways of her household. You know, she pays attention. She sees what, what the father is doing. And she imitates those things if, you know, if they're worth imitating. And she sets the example for her children. And she's usually the one that is there to guide and direct them. Because, again, she's the one that's there the most. But let's, let's turn to Proverbs chapter 14. Proverbs 14, the father and the mother have very, very important roles in order for the home to be a, a safe and a secure and a happy place. Here in Proverbs 14, verse 1, talks about the wise woman. It says, the wise woman builds her house, but the foolish pulls it down with her hands. You know, the, the expression goes, you know, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy, right? And that's very, very true. Very, very true oftentimes. And so a mother and a father both have huge roles in the home, in the peace, and in the security of the home, of the family. You know, all homes are houses, but not all houses are homes. A home is something that we make over time. A house is something that we can build or we can buy. And when we move away, the home and the family comes with us. And the house, the physical dwelling place, stays behind. You know, my father retired after 22 years in the Navy. And uh, during that time, during my first 18 years of life, I had 18 different moves. And so uh, 
we were definitely, we were constantly on the go, uh, moving from coast to coast. And I remember very vividly what it was like leaving one home and moving to another. And we were never really in a home for more than two or three years. That was the most. Uh, ironically, um, after I left home over 25 years ago, since then my parents have moved twice. So uh, they're definitely uh, enjoying uh, their retired life and not having to move quite so often. But I knew that uh, in my moves, um, because our family was very happy, our family was very close growing up, that as long as we were all together, you know, that the home moved with us. You know, we often have an attachment to our physical house, but ultimately it's not the physical structure that we're attached to, it's those who make up the home. It's the memories that we create there. You know, if we're away from home for a long period of time, you know, we get homesick. My dad used to talk about being, when he'd be gone on the ship for six months at a time, he felt homesick being away from us all. You know, as an adult, I've gone back and I've visited several of the homes that I, I lived in as a child. And uh, it was always a really neat experience to go and do that because seeing those homes brought back pleasant memories, pleasant memories of my childhood. And I think all of us can probably relate to those feelings. I'm betting I'm not the only one that's gone back and revisited an old home. Let's go to Genesis chapter 7. The Hebrew word for both house and home is baith, B-A-Y-I-T-H, baith. You know, both come from Strong's 1004, and there's no difference uh, between them. When house and home you know, are used in the Old Testament here, it's oftentimes there's no difference. Baith is used most often in the Old Testament, actually, to refer to family rather than a physical house or a physical structure. And it's first used here in Genesis chapter 7 and verse number 1. Genesis 7 verse 1. Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, Baeth, you and your family, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. You see, in ancient Hebrew tradition, the home and the family goes together. You know, it's like for us today, you know, it's hard to, to talk about the home without, you know, thinking about the family. You know, when somebody asks you, how's it going at home? You know, uh, if you were to reply and say, oh, well, the heater's working. You know, wood stove's going fine. That's not usually the answer that they're looking for when they ask that question. When someone asks us about home, you know, instinctively, you know, we think about our family. We think about the people that we live with in the home. Now, spiritually speaking, when we talk about home, we're also talking about a family, our church family. That's what our spiritual home is. Romans chapter 8, Romans 8, shows us that we are a part of God's spiritual family. Romans chapter 8 there's obviously many scriptures we could actually turn to to show this point, but we'll look here at Romans 8, and beginning in verse 15, it explains how we become part of the family of God. Romans 8 and verse 15 says, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, or sonship, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. We are called to be children of God. And we have received sonship, the spirit of sonship, into the God family. And because we are God's children, we're part of this amazing promise that we can be heirs to the everlasting kingdom of our elder brother Jesus Christ, together, joint heirs. And if we are children of God and we are joint heirs with Christ, then that makes us spiritual brothers and sisters, doesn't it? 
right? In Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians 2 goes on and tells us whose household we are members of. Ephesians 2, we'll begin in verse 19. It says, Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. And then it goes on to tell us a little bit about this household. Verse 20, Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in him, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. And so God is building a spiritual home, and we all are members of that home. And we live here so that God has a place for his Spirit, his presence to dwell. He's here among us today. You know, we call ourselves brothers and sisters in Christ, and we do that because we are all being built together as members of the household of God. Let's look at John 14. Here in John 14, we see that God, he doesn't just come and dwell with with just anyone. There are requirements if you want to have your home with God. So John 14, we'll read verses 21 through 23. John 14, 21, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. Yeah, reminds me of the sermonette. Yeah. We show God that we love him. One of the ways we do that is when we obey him is when we keep his commandments. Verse 22, Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Well, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, again, he will keep my word. And my father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. And so it's pretty clear here that Obedience to God is a requirement in order to be a part of the God household. That's no different than you know children you know, who live in the family with their with their physical parents. You know, honoring your father and your mother is a very very important command to God, and so obeying God and keeping His commandments is a is a condition for membership in the God home. Matthew chapter 7, Matthew 7 shows us what the foundation of our home should be. Matthew chapter 7, you know, we read a few minutes ago how about how Jesus Christ is our chief cornerstone. Matthew 7 here agrees with that. Matthew 7 beginning in verse 24. Matthew 7 verse 24, Therefore whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, Jesus says, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell. And great was its fall. And so our home, our spiritual home, our physical home, is to be founded on the spiritual rock, Jesus Christ. Unless we conduct ourselves the way Jesus Christ did and obey the commandments that Jesus Christ gave and, and did himself, our home will be blown away from the winds and the rain. It will be gone. And so now that we've established the, the foundation and the cornerstone of our spiritual home, then the home, after that, is, is framed and it's fitted by whom? Well, by the people. It was said that the hardest thing about building a house is what? 
finishing it, right? Sometimes it could take years for a house to be finished. The physical house's foundation, walls, and roof are are constructed relatively quickly, but what really takes time are all those quality finishing touches that get put in the house on the inside. Just as it is with our physical homes, our spiritual home should also be a place of refuge. When we come together to worship, we should be here in a safe haven. You and I should be protecting each other from from the dangers and stresses outside this home. Do you think the word sanctuary? The word sanctuary, it's an interesting term. It's used in, in the sense of a person, of taking a person in, of protecting them. You, know, you bring them into sanctuary. When you read about someone being in a sanctuary, where are they? Well, usually they are in church. Church is considered a sanctuary because it represents the house of God. And it represents the place where God's presence is dwelling. Now in Exodus 25, Exodus chapter 25 shows that the, the tabernacle in the wilderness, it was called a sanctuary. And then later on, you know, the temple was also called a sanctuary as well. But we'll just see here Exodus 25, pick a few verses out of here. Exodus 25, we'll read beginning in verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering. From everyone who gives it willingly with his heart, you shall take my offering. And so then it goes on to talk about gold and silver and bronze and precious stones. But then in verse number 8, verse number 8 it says, And let them make me a sanctuary. Why? that I may dwell among them. God has always desired to dwell among his people. And so a sanctuary was a place where God went so that he could be with, he could protect and and guide and direct his people. First you have the tabernacle, and then the temple, and then ultimately the church, or what God created to be sanctuaries. And when you consider a church, when you consider the church, the, the church is not the building that you meet in. The church is the people. You know, in the Bible, the word church is a translation of the Greek word ekklesia. Ekklesia meaning a calling out. You know, church in the Bible never refers to a building or a place, but always to people, the ones called out of society by God. You know, God's creating children. He's building his family through us. You know, the church of the Bible is not a cold stone building, but a group of warm and loving people that are specifically, specially chosen by God to fill roles. You know, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 12 defines the church as simply the body of Christ. The church is a spiritual organism, not a physical building or organization. And members of the church, you know, we go to meet in a building. And a congregation, you know, we meet in buildings. Um, sometimes we have to meet in people's homes. That's not as often now. But uh, you know, no matter where we meet, the church is still the spiritual body of Christ. There have been times in the history of God's church where brethren were forced to to meet in homes because it was not safe for them to to meet in a central location. And it may be that way again in the future, maybe even in our lifetimes. We may not always have the, the peace and the safety of our physical surroundings, but in God's presence, with the Holy Spirit dwelling among us, hopefully there will be peace and shelter among ourselves. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 Corinthians 3 shows that God's presence does dwell in you and I today. Let's see here in 1 Corinthians 3. I'm going to read verses 16 and 17 out of a New Living Translation. 1 Corinthians 3, beginning in verse 16. 
says, don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the spirit of God lives in you? God will bring ruin to anyone who ruins this temple. For God's temple is holy, and you Christians are that temple. There's a principle in Proverbs 25 which says, don't exalt yourself in the presence of the king. The idea is that when you go into the presence of the king, if he's the supreme ruler of the land, and you go in his presence and you tread very carefully, you walk softly, and you're, you speak very careful, and you're very, very respectful of the king, and you watch what you do. Well, I think the same, it should be the same for us when we come before God and Jesus Christ here to worship them. You know, it's God's presence in the sanctuary that we come before when we come here to worship on the Sabbath. You know, we should be on our best behavior while we're here. You know, since the time of Aaron, God has had higher expectations and requirements for those who enter his sanctuary. You remember that there were rules, you know, about entering the Holy of Holies, for instance. You had to, only certain people could. You had to dress a certain way. Um, you know, and then the temple. There were areas of the temple that was that was restricted to the priests and to certain people. And again, there were the rituals and, and the things that they had to do and the cleansings that they had to do before that they could, could go there. Well, in that sense, you know, we should come before God in his sanctuary in a humble attitude, a humble approach. You know, he is our father and he offers us sanctuary. He offers us shelter and he offers us protection spiritually here in this place. And so we take refuge here in the presence of God. God is our refuge and our strength. There's a scripture in Matthew chapter 11 that addresses the in principle God's calling and one aspect of that calling. So let's see here Matthew 11. Matthew 11 beginning in verse 28. Matthew 11 28, it says, Come to me, Jesus saying here, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, Jesus is not saying that he'll just automatically just take all the burden off of you, you know, but that he will give us peace. He'll lighten our burdens in our minds, and he may well take the, the burden away, if that's his choice. Verse 29, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You know, this is what God ultimately intended his calling to be, a call to rest, a call for us to remove our burdens and to place them in God's hands. Verse 30, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I know we all we all have our struggles. We all struggle with various things. You know, some of us are in bondage to health. Some are in oppression with their relationships. Some struggle financially. But God is always there to help us with our burdens. You know, one way He helps to helps to lighten our burdens is through the church. You know, the church is our home where we, we should be able to have rest, have rest from the, the struggles that we face the other six days of the week. As it says, if, if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. One member is honored, all the members rejoice with him. Yeah, I, I first wrote this sermon a little over five years ago, and it's actually morphed quite a bit uh, since I first wrote it. Um, that's because uh, life happens and experience ha experiences happen. Um, there was a time uh, a few years ago when my physical home was, was suddenly shattered. You know, one evening everything was fine and came home the next night and my whole world was, was turned upside down. And you know, for me, 
uh, my physical family, uh, my, my physical, the nearest family that I had uh, was over 2,000 miles away. And so uh, they were very, very loving. They were very, very helpful to me, encouraging to me during that time. But, you know, locally, I had to, I had to find solace um, with my spiritual family, with my brothers and sisters, to the point where for three years I actually lived uh, in a, an apartment right there, right next door to our church building. Because for me, it was very, very important. Not important to live next to my church building, but it was important because the church building conveyed a, a sense of peace, you know, a sense of fellowship, you know, a sense of pleasantness, fond memories, represented stability for me at a time where I really needed it. It was a place of refuge for me because of the people that were in the building. And so I felt the need to be as close to it as possible. Unfortunately, over the years, I think we can all think of times and come up with examples where the sanctuary wasn't the safe haven that it should have been. And usually it happens when there's gossip, when there's strife, when there's division, when Satan is there swirling in our midst. These types of things should never be happening in the household of God. Now, I have a request that I'd like to make you know, of all of you. If I'm ever in a conversation with any of you and you hear me you know, complaining about someone or something that someone has done, then please stop me and ask me, have you actually gone to that person? Have you spoken to them about it? Because, uh, you know, it can, ha- it can happen more easily, more often than what we realize without even, even thinking about it. Constructive criticism should be given to the person only and not to other people, at least, you know, initially anyway. There may be times after you've initially gone to someone and the situation may not be resolved where you have to uh, bring other people into the mix. But that's only if you're looking for a solution, not if you're looking to just vent, not to slander or gossip. There was an expression that I I believe was first used in World War II in the shipyards. It was loose lips sink ships, right? Right? Loose lips sink, sink ships. You know, it was made, you know, it was said that, you know, the people were not to talk about the location and the positions of the ships in the war, not even in casual conversation among themselves. You just never know, never knew if there was an informer in the midst, you know, that could overhear that. You know, being aware of unguarded talk, loose talk, unproductive talk, unchristian talk, tearing people down can lead to sinking ships as well. Using the tongue in an unwise manner is the quickest way, maybe the quickest way to destroy the peace and the unity in our home. And it's something that we must not do. Each each year, our each East Texas congregation, we put on a preteen camp. We call it Camp Pineywoods. Gabriel was there very first year of the camp. And in fact, that's where I first met him and, and Mr. Irvin. But we try to create at the camp what's called the zone, you know, where we have a place where the kids can come and they can have a safe place that they can be, you know, without being made fun of, without being ridiculed, that they could just come and, and have positive reinforcement given to them. I'd like uh, each of us to stop and ask ourselves, am I doing my part to make this sanctuary, this congregation, a home for each and every spiritual brother and sister that's here? We are the temple of God. We are the sanctuary. We are living in God's home. Let's look at Psalm 84. God's intent and his purpose purpose for his home is to be a place of refuge, 
place of rest and protection. And if we're not promoting that in the way that we treat one another, then you know, woe unto us. Psalm 84, beginning in verse 1. How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you. Now here's someone who really desires, really, really wants to be in God's home. And it's because in God's home, they can, those who are in God's home feel at home. They feel sheltered from outside pressures, and, and they want that nurturing and that protection that comes from being in that environment. You know, God's home you know, includes all sorts of people. It includes the young, the old, the strong, the weak. He brings us all together into his household. So how should we as members in God's household treat one another? I'd like to give us some specific things to think about. First of all, when we walk in the door at church, we shouldn't come here only looking for ourselves to be inspired. We should come look here looking to make a contribution, even in the smallest of ways. You know, if we if we don't feel at home in church, you know, if we just don't feel comfortable here, then the first place I think we need to look is ourselves. We need to examine ourselves. Am I giving? Am I serving? Am I doing what I can be doing? Am I contributing to this home? Am I helping others? You know, in my opinion, serving others is, is the quickest way for, for a new person can, to find their way in their home and, and to feel comfortable. The success of the God household depends greatly on the level of investment of all of its members. You know, we can't have a strong household if we as members are not committed to the ultimate mission, to our common shared purpose. You know, we're called to do a work. We're called to preach the gospel to all the world and to prepare a people for what? For eternal life. If we have people who are not focused on these common goals, and are not brought into this mission, then reaching an, an ideal household is, is going to be very, very difficult. Again, I'll just reference 1 Corinthians 12, which tells us that the body is one and has many members. And every member of that body is dependent upon the other members in order to function in the, in the fullest sense. Because we're, we're fit together. You know, everybody in the body has been given... A job to do. We must, and we must, with God's guidance, create a safe and a secure environment that allows us all to work together and allows everyone in that environment to be able to thrive. The home is a place where we can try new things, we can explore our, our gifts and our talents to step outside our comfort zone in a loving and a secure environment. When people work on inventions, you know, they don't immediately take them out into the public's, public's place and, and demonstrate them there. No, obviously they, they work on their ex experiments in a controlled laboratory place where they work out the bugs and they work out, uh, you know, they work through and they try to perfect their work. You know, when we serve at church, we are in a way testing our spiritual gifts amongst each other, preparing ourselves, preparing ourselves for opportunities to be able to use those gifts in the future in a much greater way. You know, whether it's in a in a more active role in preaching the gospel to the world, or even in the future in the kingdom. So it's important that our sanctuary be a safe place for people to develop their spiritual gifts. If this was one of my goals 
in bringing a preteen camp to our congregation five years ago. Now, obviously, we had a, a void in our region that needed to be filled um, with a camp, and we wanted to have a place to be able to bring our, our region preteens in so that they could see how God's way works and learn more about developing a relationship with God themselves. But besides that, the other big goal that we had was to pro provide a venue so that our congregation and others as well could develop their gifts in a peaceful, secure environment and do it in a way that would hopefully lead to spiritual growth for everyone who wanted to step forward. You know, we wanted to give as many people as, as possible an opportunity to be able to step forward and to serve. Serve in ways that you know perhaps they wouldn't otherwise do or they wouldn't have the opportunity to do. And many people have done just that. Your know, home should be a place for growth. And it's a beautiful thing when our spiritual home is healthy and allows for the development of our spiritual gifts. Now, brethren, this is our home. Our spiritual home is in this body and these congregations that we serve and we visit with all of us who have committed ourselves to the household of God. We need each other. You know, it's really neat when, you know, we can leave our home congregations and we can go and visit other congregations and we can feel that, that same love and that same warmth amongst each other. I know I, I feel that when I come here. I really appreciate that. That's what God's Spirit, working through His people, helps work to produce. Your families in the physical home take care of each other, and so we have to take care of our spiritual family as well. In order to do that, we have to lay the groundwork. We have to develop relationships with one another. Let's look at Hebrews 10. Now, God desires that we get to know each other beyond just being acquaintances, that we get past our surface impressions of each other and, and get to know one another more deeply. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 24. Hebrews 10, verse 24 says, And let us consider one another in order to, why? Well, to stir up love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. So we are to consider one another. We are to exhort one another. You know, the Greek word here for consider means to observe fully. To observe fully. Exhorting one another means to, to summon, to admonish, to beseech, to encourage, to strengthen. To consider and exhort one another first requires having a relationship with them. You know, there's, a, there's an older lady um, who's in the uh, Rustin congregation, a sister congregation of, of mine, and uh, you know, we, we keep in touch. Um, and it's really neat because she's a big New Orleans Saints football fan. And so we were texting back and forth, she and I were, during the game. And obviously the, the last game this last Sunday had a, a very disappointing outcome, <laughs> very disappointing for her. But... Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really neat to, to find ways that you can connect with people and maintain the relationships, not just on the Sabbath. And, and it's, it's nice, too, with, personally, with the phones and, and with being able to text. It makes it, it, makes it easier uh, to be able to reach out to people and, and to do things like that. And why do we need to get to know each other better? Because we need to be able to stir each other up to love and to good works. We need to know each other well enough so that we, we know what motivates each other and gets people to the point of developing their full potential, of showing love and good works. And we need to be able to sometimes gently push each other to better live the way of life that we have been called to. Why is it so important to stir one another up 
to good works? But verse 26, For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. You know, in this spiritual home that we live in today, this is our chance, our one chance for those who have learned the truth, for those who, who have been called. Either we will be raised and transformed into spirit beings at the return of Jesus Christ when that day comes, or we'll be cast into the lake of fire. When it comes time to leave home you know, spiritually, that's it. We have no second chance. And so, brethren, we're in this together. We need to keep each other on God's path. That's part of what Hebrews 10.25 is telling us, that as a congrega congregation and, and a part of a larger body of believers, that we can feel comfortable enough to lovingly admonish one another without fear of that person taking it the wrong way and turning around and, and walking away and leaving our home. In Proverbs 27 and verse 6, Proverbs 27, 6 shows, it, shows us it's easier to receive admonition from a friend. Proverbs 27, verse number 6, where it says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. You know, I think again about our children. You know, correction from someone that they don't know very well is not going to be taken positively by them. For children and for us adults, it's much easier for us to accept correction from someone who has already put time into having a relationship with you. Someone you know loves you and cares for you and, and wants your best interests. It's a lot easier to give exhortation to someone that you have observed fully. It's a lot less nerve-wracking, and they're much more apt to follow through when you've already had that relationship with them. And so let's make it a goal in our home to stir each other up more fully, to observe one another more fully, to stir each other up to good works. Now, relationships within the home are vitally important. Now, how many of you have physical brothers and sisters? Have or have had physical brothers and sisters? Yeah, just about everybody, right? And I'm sure all of us have always gotten along with our brothers and sisters without any kind of spouting, any kind of arguments and, or anything, right? Well, obviously not. <laughs> you know, have we... You know, when we get into spats with our, our brothers and sisters, you know, maybe we said something, you know, to them or somebody said something that offended us or we were offended by their actions. Maybe we allow our thoughts to grow into bitterness and we give our brother and sister that cold shoulder, you know, that animosity and resentment grows, further damaging the relationship or worse. That's not how God intended our relationships to be. Let's turn to Matthew 18, Matthew chapter 18, and let's, let's see how we're supposed to, to act and to react amongst one another. Matthew 18, we'll read, just, we'll read verses 3 and 4. Matthew 18, verse 3, Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you'll by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And part of their nature is that little children tend to quickly move beyond their fussing and their squabbles, and they're usually quick to forgive and forget. Now, obviously, every one of us is different. We're all different. We all come from different backgrounds. We've all been brought into this spiritual home from different places. You know, some of us are maybe extreme. I'm not thinking of anybody specific when I say this, but you know, some are, are maybe really good at sarcasm. You know, and it's hard to get beyond. You know, sometimes for me, when somebody's really sarcastic, it's hard to get beyond the sarcasm to, to hear what the person maybe is truly saying. 
you know, some are quiet and contemplative, and it's it's hard to, to reach them and to, to get them to talk, and the conversation can be one-sided. You know, some are brash and loud and in your face and, and, uh, and outgoing to the point where you know, it's like, give me a little space here. You know, sometimes you know, we can just rub each other the wrong way you know, due to our personal quirks. However, you know, we have to get beyond those idiosyncrasies. You know, if we're not careful, our, we can let those personal quirks blow up into full-blown relationship issues, which is, can be very damaging to our home. It is God's desire that we all be together in unity. Psalm 133, Psalm 133, verse 1. Psalm 133, verse 1 is another familiar scripture which says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. You know, we see God's ideal. We see that brethren can and should dwell together in unity. Just as in a physical home, it, unity takes a lot of effort in the spiritual home as well. You know, if, if somebody brand new walks through our doors at church, would, would it feel like home here to them? I know that you all have had some, some newer people come, and that's great. You know, when a baby is born and, and added to the family, you know, they get a lot of attention, a lot of oohs and ahs. I remember when I was a teenager and, and I had two sisters that were born during my teenage years, and they received a lot of attention from us. You know, when new people come into our spiritual family, I mean, we try to reach out to them, try to get to know them, Try to present our assembly as a place where people love each other, and they show it. It should be a place of refuge, a place where somebody could come and thrive and grow spiritually. And I do think that you all, you all have that here. And that's a wonderful thing. Every person's experience, though, is different. Just because it may seem like home to you and me doesn't mean it feels like that for everyone else. And so... We have to do what we can to make this sanctuary a home for everyone. Because we don't want any homeless people here. The hospitality is very important in our home. You know, the Jews, they take hospitality very seriously. You know, they believe the, the, the Jewish form of hospitality is actually a form of worship. And by showing love to others and being hospitable to them, they are, they believe that they are showing love to God. And where is it that people uh, tend to, to gather? And when you have a gathering together of people, uh, where is it that they tend to gather? Well, oftentimes they gather near the kitchen. They gather in places where there is food. You know, to a certain extent, you know, we, we congregate on, here at Sabbath services because we're looking for spiritual food. But the importance of physical food is something that cannot be overemphasized either. You know, food is a social experience. You know, it encourages conversation, conversation you know, that we might not would otherwise have. Sharing a meal with someone is important. You know, whether it's snacks or a full-blown meal at someone's home, food and conversation go together. And I think it's great that you all have your, your potlucks here. I think it's a wonderful thing. We, after church in East Texas, you know, we have our, our snack tables as well and go get our snacks and everybody sits down at the tables and they visit and, and they talk. You know, food, food is definitely a wonderful thing and it contributes so much to having a, a more warm and a, and a comfortable home. When we come together to be at church, we're not called to just be a social club. Social activities are important, but they are meant to accomplish something. Having Sabbath services is supposed to accomplish something. Being together is supposed to accomplish something. And what it is to accomplish is the creation, formation, and growth of the household of God. The very family of God. In Revelation chapter 21, 
we see that one day God himself will make his home here on earth among all of mankind. Let's look at Revelation 21. This is one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible. Revelation 21, beginning in verse number 2. I'm going to read this from the New Revised Standard Version. Revelation 21, verse 2. This is John writing, says, I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them as their God. They will be his peoples and God himself will be with them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. So brethren, we've seen how God made his sanctuary in the tabernacle, in the temple, and then with his church today. I hope that each of us has found a spiritual home here in this congregation. I know I feel at home when I visit here, and I appreciate that. Our congregation is a home where God's presence dwells. It can be a sanctuary of refuge and peace, a place where we can worship God together in the way he has instructed us, a place that we can invest ourselves in the work that must be done, a place where we can stir up spiritual gifts, a place where we can get to know each other and help each other to grow spiritually, a place that's hospitable and filled with the love of God. You know, it's very comforting to think about that in this cold and cruel world that we live in. Home captured the very best things that we should yearn for. A loving family, peace, comfort, safety, rest, total well-being. If the Lord doesn't build the house, they who build it instead are laboring in vain. So I hope this message has given us all some food for thought and the desire to make our spiritual and physical home even better than what it is now. And so let's each do our part to ensure for all of us there's no place like home.